Why were you born? Is there a meaning for your life? Were you put here for a reason? Is your existence part of a divine plan? Was mankind placed on earth by an all-wise creator as part of a great purpose, a master plan? Knowing the answer is supremely important. This broadcast brings the awesome truth. The World to Come. The Restored Church of God presents David C. Pack. What could be more important to understand than the purpose for your life? Atheists refuse to know. Those unable to accept the existence of God certainly cannot accept that He has a master plan. Cynics scoff at the possibility of knowing. They see the confusion and wide disagreement over this question and conclude it can never be answered. Scientists can't discover this knowledge through laboratory analysis. Honest astronomers, microbiologists, and others acknowledge God exists, but this alone does not reveal His purpose for mankind. Philosophers cannot discern it through meditation or discussion. Divinely revealed answers cannot come from centuries of pondering questions. Educators cannot teach what they themselves were never taught. Those who merely teach from books written by other men cannot teach what those books do not contain. Astrologers dazzle with tricks that reveal nothing of value. Do any seriously think those who sell fortune-telling as true understanding, who supposedly channel the dead in the spirit world, actually demon spirits, hold the meaning of life? Who is kidding whom? Theologians offer no more than humanly devised counterfeits. All religions profess to hold the answers to life's questions, but their ideas pale as cheap, empty substitutes when the awesome truth of God's plan is fully understood. Most live their entire lives without a clue as to why they are here. They drift aimlessly, unconcerned about the answers to life's greatest questions. Why life and why death? Some enjoy debating the meaning of life, but never arrive at the correct answers. Many conclude mankind is little more than a product of evolution, of blind, dumb luck. The world is experiencing an explosion of knowledge amidst ever greater human suffering, unhappiness, discontent, and confusion. Why such ever-worsening moral decline alongside astonishing materialistic progress? Why? And where do we go from here? The number and severity of problems facing mankind have never been greater. Disease, pollution, poverty, ignorance, religious confusion, war, crime, violence, hunger, immorality, slavery, oppression, political upheaval, and much more. Why? Problems both between and within nations have never brought more division between peoples. Again, why? Also, existing problems grow collectively worse instead of better. Why? Why at every turn is man botched, bungled, and failed miserably in all efforts to solve his truly great problems? Individually, people have never seemed more incapable of addressing and overcoming their personal problems. As with the world in general, the passing of time sees individuals and families drowning in a sea of moral decadence and under seemingly insurmountable difficulties. Why? Men have created many amazing technological inventions, but they cannot create solutions to their problems. They've harnessed the power of computers to process vast amounts of information, but cannot correctly process their personal difficulties. Scientists have discovered much about the size, magnificence, and precision of the universe, but they cannot discover the way to peace. Astronomers can find majestic, beautiful new galaxies throughout the universe, but they cannot find a way to preserve the beauty and majesty of Earth. Scientists have also unleashed the power of the atom, but are powerless to unleash answers to life's biggest questions. Educators have taught millions how to earn a living, but not how to live, because they themselves don't know how to live. With the creative genius of man having created so many weapons of mass destruction and ever worse forms of terrorism in a world incapable of combating these, the world is in a terrible mess. 
The presidential historian Peggy Noonan summarized mankind's complex, jumbled history this way. In the long ribbon of history, life has been one long stained and tangled mess, full of famine, horror, war, and disease. We must have thought we had it better because man had improved. But man doesn't really improve, does he? Man is man. Human nature is human nature. The impulse to destroy coexists with the desire to build and create and make better. Who could disagree? So something is terribly wrong. Mankind's extraordinary creative genius has left him incomplete, and it has proven insufficient to solve his problems. The power and creative prowess of his mind has been more channeled to destruction than to productive effort in planning and inventing. Sir Winston Churchill, the famous prime minister of once Great Britain, proclaimed, there is a purpose being worked out here below, as he put it. He understood that in some fashion a supreme being was working out an unseen plan on earth. But what is it? Churchill did not know. Many long to know what God is doing here below, but have no idea how to learn what it is. Mankind is ignorant of where to turn. Humanity does not know what the source of instruction is. The creator of human beings sent with them a detailed instruction book containing vital information. It explains the nature, design, and purpose of his greatest of all creations. It identifies the hidden key, the missing dimension to the right and proper use of the mind. It explains the way to peace, happiness, abundance, and universal prosperity. But this greatest instruction book, the Holy Bible, is almost universally ignored, misrepresented, misunderstood, and rejected. The result? Problems, troubles, and evils of civilization mount. With no solution in sight, conditions only grow worse. Stop and think. Apply basic logic. Would God create his own marvel of engineering your mind and send it without an instruction book explaining how to use it? Of course not. This overlooked and misunderstood book does exist. We need to examine this manual, which unlocks the mystery of why you exist. It offers hope for you and solutions to humanity's problems. It explains why man is incapable of solving his problems without divine intervention from the one who is working out his purpose. It explains the meaning of life and answers the most important question you face. Why were you born? The evolutionist cannot answer this. He believes life evolved over millions of years. He believes his theory explains the presence of millions of plants and animals on earth, with mankind merely the highest animal in the evolutionary chain. Evolutionists reject special creation by a supreme creator and therefore the source of revealed knowledge he sent with his creation. Proponents of the evolutionary theory cannot explain man's awesome potential or why it has never been realized, nor why things keep getting worse when evolution teaches mankind is supposedly evolving to a higher order. The world's religions have utterly failed in giving meaning or hope to life. These religions have almost universally caved to the evolutionists. Even professing Christianity has largely rejected the Genesis creation account as myth and ancient Hebrew literature. Yet, while rejecting many scriptures that explain the purpose of life, millions claim to believe a few selected passages and falsely label themselves Christianity. But the book of books offers hope and meaning. Here is the truth from this vital instruction book made plain. Genesis 1 records the creation account. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. These are the Bible's first words. This all-encompassing statement is inclusive and straightforward with no ambiguities or room for doubt. God says this is what he did. On the sixth day of creation, God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Man was made to look like, was made after, the God kind. Man was the crowning achievement, the supreme pinnacle of God's creation. He was not of any animal kind, but was made in God's image and likeness. This reveals an enormous difference between men and every kind of animal. 
Verse 25 reveals animals were made in a different way and that each was made after his kind. Notice, God made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and everything that creeps upon the earth after his kind. Horses look like horses, dogs like dogs, cows look like cows, birds like birds. None of these and nothing else is formed and shaped in the image and likeness of God. So says God. Men are not part of the animal kind. They do not carry the likeness of any beast of the earth. As part of the God kind, man was created to enter a relationship with his creator that animals can never realize. At this point, it is vital to understand something about who and what God is. Genesis 1.1 reveals critically important knowledge. It opens, in the beginning, God. The Hebrew word translated God is Elohim. This word is uniplural, like team, group, family, or church. God is one family, presently composed of two beings. Verse 26 said, Let us, more than one, make man in our image after our likeness. There was clearly more than one person involved in the creation. This records the God family doing the speaking and creating. The Apostle John in the New Testament amplifies what Moses recorded. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. If there is one who was God, but who was also with God, it is obvious that two beings, two persons, are being described. This is why Christ could be God and with God at the same time. The Greek word rendered word is logos. It means spokesman. This is the one who became Christ and the one speaking in Genesis. John 1.14 continues, The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The only God being who ever became flesh to dwell among men is Jesus Christ. Remember, it says the word was made flesh. Jesus was not flesh until he came to earth to become the Savior of mankind. Beginning in Genesis 2.4 is another name translated as God, Y-H-V-H. It is best rendered the eternal or the ever-living one, the spokesman, the word. Animals possess instinct. No evolutionist has ever successfully explained why this is or how it is even possible. Why would bees return to their hive day after day, generation after generation, making honey the same way they did 1,000 years ago unless they were designed to do this? Why do baby cows and horses stand almost immediately after birth? It was programmed into them through instinct. Why do birds know to fly south and at just the right time? Then how do many know to return each year to the exact same tree in Central or South America and then fly back north right on schedule? Instinct. How would all bears know to eat enough food to survive hibernation all winter? And how would all bears even know to hibernate unless this was built into their instinctive behavior? Why do all wolves hunt the same way, in packs, and eat the same things? Why does almost every bird have its own distinct nest-building design? As marvelous as is instinctive capability, it is dwarfed by the capacity and power of human intellect. Humans can acquire knowledge, reach the moon, and create supercomputers, design buildings the height of six football fields, and discover secrets of the atom. Animals have no such capability. The psalmist wrote, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. This is most true of your brain, the human mind. But it is incomplete, and so are you. People do not instinctively know all they need to know to operate successfully throughout their lives. They must acquire ever more knowledge as they grow older and as more demands are placed upon them. All knowledge is either physical knowledge, how to work with matter and physical things, or spiritual knowledge, what is necessary for people to develop personal relationships with both God and their fellow man. All knowledge is one or the other. Physical knowledge is acquired through the five senses, sight, hearing, smell, touch, and taste. People know they must acquire certain knowledge and add to it throughout their lives. The senses permit this. Man is made of physical matter, 
flesh. While not composed of spirit, like God, he is fashioned, formed in the image and likeness of God. Adam was physical. He breathed air and required food and water. God intended to begin his spiritual creation with Adam, a process never involving animals. A new booklet from author David C. Pack, How God's Kingdom Will Come, The Untold Story, is now available on rcg.org. This booklet explains exactly how the kingdom of God will be established, never understood until now. Visit rcg.org today to read How God's Kingdom Will Come, The Untold Story, or to order a hard copy free of charge. Let's now examine the bigger picture of God's purpose. You are not the first to be concerned with God's overall plan or wonder why you exist. Job asked, If a man die, shall he live again? God inspired him to answer his own question. All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. You shall call and I will answer you. You will have a desire to the work of your hands. Job knew he was the work of God's hands. He knew God desired a certain purpose that involved a process at work within him. He understood that one day God would call him from the grave and he would answer, thus fulfilling his purpose. This is important knowledge that could only be revealed by God. Job could not otherwise have known it. God is at work in those he has called. He is fashioning, molding, and building within them holy, righteous character. His character. Notice, O Lord, we are the clay and you are potter, and we are all the work of your hand. Sadly, many will not allow God to work with them. They fight his purpose. They think they know better than the God who made them. Many refuse to be told what to do and to be clay in God's hands. This was Adam's problem. Most people have absolutely no idea that God actively works within human beings he has called or what he is doing when he does. God is now actively working in the minds of only those few who have his Holy Spirit. Humans are not born with God's character, and God cannot instantly infuse them with it by divine fiat. Character must be developed. The true Christian increases in understanding and grows in grace and knowledge. He endures a lifetime of overcoming because he is in training for a supreme purpose. Those called understand, he that shall endure unto the end shall be saved, Christ said. Bible study and earnest prayer are part of the Christian's daily schedule. The one called has found the pearl of great price, Christ said, and is determined to build the spiritual character and nature of God. While none of this will earn him salvation, it is the substance of his character that determines his reward. The Apostle Paul understood how God works in Christians. He recognized that salvation and even faith to receive it are free gifts. They cannot be earned. But this does not mean God is not actively working requiring good works in human beings. Consider, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it, the faith, is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Paul said, we are his workmanship. What could be plainer? God has a purpose at work within each person. The false notion of just believing in Jesus thwarts God's supreme purpose of fashioning people through careful workmanship, like a potter with clay. Paul added, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Those God works with are literally a new creation. Each person that God calls is presented with the same choice Adam and Eve faced, yielding to God and his government or to Satan in his nature. God is a father. He has one spirit-composed son, but will later have many more. He is reproducing himself by developing his character in yielded, 
conquered, spirit-begotten human beings. As human fathers beget their children physically, God begets His children spiritually. Just as little children grow up to look like their parents, so do God's children slowly take on the spiritual likeness of their parent in holy, righteous character. The Apostle Peter described Christians as partakers of the divine nature, the nature of God. There is the physical nature of creation, human nature, and God's nature. God is refashioning corrupt, carnal human nature into wonderful, glorious, perfect, holy, spiritual character, His divine nature. Character is understanding, knowing right from wrong, and doing what is right instead of what is wrong. God reveals what is right, but it is through the power of free moral agency, deciding to do what is right, that righteous character is built. Character is consciously choosing the right way against resistance. This is not easy. It is swimming against the current, rather than drifting lazily in the direction it is flowing. It is building the fruits of God's Spirit. Animals develop none of these traits. This takes time because character is built through experience. God has perfect character in all respects. He is love. Love is the fulfilling of the law, which requires yielding to God. It is outgoing, outflowing concern for others, putting them first ahead of self-interests. Satan's nature is selfish, incoming, and concerned only with what is best for self and how to get more for self. This is the attitude he injected into Adam and Eve when they ate the forbidden fruit. Are you seeing that while God made man in the form and shape physically of himself, it does not end there? You were created to become like God, to build perfect, holy, righteous character. God is reproducing himself in human beings. Again, as you physically look like your parents and your children resemble you, God wants you to look like Him in spiritual character. So then, God is reproducing Himself in those who have received His Holy Spirit. He is creating children that will look and be just like Him. To build the very character of God is the reason you exist. But there is more. God has allotted 7,000 years, seven millennial days, to work out His plan. We are nearing the end of the sixth day, 6,000 years, allotted to man under Satan. Christ will soon return to establish God's government and perfect spiritual law on earth. Satan will be no longer able to sway this world to evil and rebellion against God's revealed knowledge. Some will reject God, refusing to obey Him. They will trust in their human minds and reject the missing dimension of God's Spirit which would have led them to eternal life. They will reject building righteousness in their life and choose to remain incomplete, unfinished in purpose and character. The book of Hebrews reveals God's awesome purpose with crystal clarity. First, understand that God created angels to be ministering spirits to assist the heirs of salvation, it says. This is their role within God's plan. Angels are not offered membership in the God family. This is why Satan, a fallen angel, so hates the idea that puny, fleshly men can receive what he has never been offered nor can ever achieve. Paul quotes two places in the Psalms. First, unto which of the angels said he at any time, You are my son, this day have I begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Question marks. Hebrews 2.5 describes the earth under the subjection of angels now, but makes clear angels will not rule over the world to come. God has never said these things to any angel. Paul quotes another psalm, explaining what has always been God's purpose. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. A scepter is a rod or staff used as a symbol of rulership or authority. In his kingdom, it is God who has all power. Finally, Paul reframes the same question about angels. To which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits, sent forth to minister for them who shall be, get this, 
heirs of salvation. This sets the stage for what we must understand. Let's really comprehend the awesome future God has prepared for all who truly serve Him. This amazing series of verses continues building an understanding and impact. Paul quotes David asking the all-important question, What is man that you are mindful of him? Since God is eternal and sits over the entire universe and has all power under his control, no wonder David asked and Paul repeated this question. The astounding answer comes next. You made man a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and did set him over the works of your hands. Paul explains that God plans to give immense power and authority to his sons. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. End of quote. When God says all things, this is what he means. The vast universe with all its quadrillions of stars and one trillion galaxies will be put under the authority of men who have been born into the family of God. In fact, the Moffat translation renders all things as the universe. This is staggering knowledge, wonderful beyond description. Make yourself grasp it. Savor what can be your future. It is the reason you exist. It explains why you were born. Request our free booklet, Why Do You Exist? It explains in detail the great purpose for your life. Also, along with your literature order, comes a free one-year subscription to The Real Truth magazine. It answers life's big questions, those that few seem willing to address. The Real Truth fills a vacuum, bringing a dimension completely missing today. Don't be without it. This broadcast has merely begun teaching the truth about why you exist. The Christian goal is to be born into the kingdom of God, to become an immortal spirit being ruling under Christ. What could be more wonderful, more glorious to look forward to? Part 2 covers more aspects of mankind's great purpose. Do not miss it. Until next time, this is David C. Pack saying goodbye, friends. This program was made available by Restored Church of God members and donors from around the globe. Explore our vast library of literature and other World to Come programs, which are all made available free of charge. To order literature featured in this program, Call toll-free 1-855-828-4646. That number again, 1-855-828-4646.